Welcome in. And uh, my name is Dave, and uh, I'm one of our consultants and trainers here with SSG. Um, it's great to see so many familiar people on the call today uh, from previous sessions. If it's your first time, welcome. It's great to have you with us as well. Okay, um, we will get started off with the session now. Um, I'll keep an eye on the participant list as we go through. Um, as I mentioned, if you just literally just joined us, okay, if for any reason you get knocked out during the session, if uh, you need to leave early, if I overrun slightly, then um, don't worry, okay, I will be providing to the register lists um, a, a slide deck of uh, today's presentation. But also, um, should you require it, we uh, I am recording the session as well, so uh, just get in touch with us at the end and we'll see how we can make that available to you. But uh, first things first, morning and welcome. And uh, today's topic we'll be covering off in the session is to look at uh, controlling risks in the workplace with PPE and RPE. Okay, um, so uh, really, like I say, really um, popular topic today. Okay, um, really great turnout, and uh, it's been a good little session. Um, just uh, some some brief points around our sort of online training etiquette. Okay, mics, please keep the mics on mute. I have muted all participants, but um, like I say, there's gonna be a lot of going through today's session that I need to cover off. So if you can keep microphones on mute. Also, webcams best actually keep off um, because there are so many people on the call, we may actually suffer in terms of bandwidth and et cetera and that sort of stuff, okay? So, um, I, you know, off is probably best. Um, we have the text chat feature. I've got that up and I'll do my best to keep watching that as it comes through, okay? Um, and I'll do my best to deal with any questions or queries or comments that come up as we go through. But after the session, obviously, if I haven't answered anything, I can go back through that chat box and I'll come back to people individually as well. And also, um, I appreciate, obviously, you know, we are still working at home in the office. Um, it's half term. OK, so uh, we might have a bit of a drain on systems uh, for, for some of us as well. So um, I do appreciate there may be some connection issues. If that is the case, I'll do my absolute best to keep watching the um, participants in the uh, in the waiting room. OK. Um, but also, like I say, if you do get knocked out and can't get, get back in again, I will be sharing the uh, slide deck with everyone at the end. OK, in terms of today's focus, then, OK, what we'll be focusing on will be uh, we're going to have a brief look at the recent update or the upcoming update to the legislation. OK, so the PPE amendment regulations and how that's being expanded. Uh, we're going to spend quite a sizable chunk on understanding around exposure levels and applying the hierarchy of risk controls. So I think that's a, a really key thing for us to focus on during this, that um, you know, PPE has its place. OK, um, and then also we're going to look at some bits around how we can select PPE and RPE, the different sort of information sources that are available to us, different calculations for RPE, that kind of thing as well. So quite a lot of stuff to cover off. Um, but hopefully all good, all useful for yourselves. Um, now, I, I always have to give a bit of a caveat to this and that sort of stuff, okay? Whilst at some point I'm going to be saying about, you know, how PPE is the last resort, and we know that PPE is the last resort as part of our hierarchy of risk controls. When it's used properly, when it's used correctly, when it's been selected correctly, okay, PPE and RPE does work and I personally have seen it save body parts I've seen it save lives okay and I appreciate many of us in the call will have done as well um, but you know I've got a couple of little images uh, to show you they are a little grisly so hopefully you've had your breakfast um, and you're okay with a couple of images but uh, our, our first one is just to bring up um, this uh, these examples here okay um, so these are both um, injuries whilst using um, grinding discs or cutting discs with abrasive wheels um, and thankfully in these instances both individuals were wearing PPE okay uh, image on the left you can see how it's how it's pierced and I think it did end up scratching the the surface of their eye slightly but um, that was certainly um, one way to get woken up whilst on uh, whilst working on site but 
you know, whilst uh, you know, the engineering controls failed or the admin controls failed or their personal use of the kit failed or just the disc itself failed as a freak accident, thankfully, wearing the PPE in that situation saved their eye, saved their life, potentially. Um, the person on the right-hand side um, he now does a lot of motivational talks and sort of uh, awareness talks uh, for companies like Arco uh, to, to say about the benefits of PPE. Um, on the day he was working on sites and um, on the occasion he was working, he was uh, cutting um, tarmac to, to sort of fit and lay pipes and his mates lent him a pair of three quid safety glasses rather than wearing his cheap sunglasses like he normally would wear. Okay. On that particular occasion, that three pound pair of glasses, again, saved his life. Um, he did have some pretty horrific injuries. Obviously, as you can see, um, fractured eye socket, fractured cheek, um, you know, quite a serious cut to the face. But on that, on that circumstance, three pounds saved his life. OK, so again, if we are using the kit as we should be, as we identify it and it's provided, then it can save lives. Uh, and almost to a uh, slightly extreme one outside of the world that we may normally get be involved in. Um, but, you know, we take something like Formula One. OK, obviously, um, you know, very, very high risk. Um, and you may well have seen the crash itself. Quite a horrific crash, quite a horrific footage. Obviously, there's a huge amount of engineering controls going into this world um, in terms of the sort of safety systems. We've got the, uh, you know, the, the, the cockpit, the drivers, helmets, all the sort of controls, the car itself. OK, but, you know, things can still go wrong. Things can still happen. And um, this happened to Roman Grosjean when he crashed in November 2020 at the Bahrain Grand Prix. He struck the barrier at 119 miles per hour. And the force uh, was measured at 67 G. OK, so horrific, uh, horrific crash. He was in those flames, trapped in that car for a total of 27 seconds. OK, um, and if anyone knows anything about sort of, you know, fuels and fires and sort of Formula One and that sort of stuff, um, it just shows a testament you know, how amazing the, uh, the controls are with their um, fire retardant sort of shoot, uh, suits clothing, et cetera. Um, but they actually did an investigation after the crash because they weren't satisfied that um, he had burns to his hand. So they've done uh, you know, quite a lot of work on actually looking at the heat transfer index on their gloves now to make sure that they can actually prevent further injuries and, and instances. So despite the ridiculous nature, he literally walked out, he literally jumped out of his car, if you remember seeing the footage. And after all that, um, he, he had that serious injury to his hand but again, the PPE worked in that situation. Uh, I always like to start off my um, um, uh, sessions as well, going over re relevant legislation and guidance, things that I've drawn from or things that are good for you guys to, to go away and, and to look at beyond today's session. Uh, the Act itself, obviously, uh, crucially important. A key one that sometimes gets overlooked is Section 2.6 when we consider around actually having consultation with our staff. And that's a really important one with PPE and RPE, because these people will be wearing this stuff for an hour, two hours more at a time. And if we start getting multiple items on together, we have quite a lot of discomforts. Um, so getting the workforce involved, getting people involved with it is actually a really, really good process. And also you get buy in from them. So they then understand why it's being used, why it's being worn. OK, and you know, they understand the controls that you're putting in place. And just picking out a couple of items uh, from the rest of the sheet there, regulations three and four from the management regs, really crucial to this topic as well. Obviously, the duty to carry out risk assessments. Well, those principles of prevention are a hierarchical process, and we'll touch base on that when we do look at those hierarchy of controls. Workplace uh, and the, the welfare regs and similar aspects coming out of CDM as well in terms of provision of, of welfare, really important that we do actually provide our workforce with suitable um, sort of sanitary conveniences, hand washing stations and the likes, because quite a lot of uh, the issues we can draw from with PPE is actually um, cross contamination or not removing our gloves properly or still wearing dirty wear whilst we're going to the toilet, having a smoke, having lunch, that kind of thing. So it's really important to understand how all these things connect uh, around this topic. 
And with this one also, we do have what we call complementary legislation. So, yeah, uh, they don't necessarily sort of sit around and say, oh, yeah, you look nice, do they? Uh, but they work together. They work in harmony. OK. And with these ones in particular, um, these kind of actually supersede PPE because these will state and dictate PPE has to be worn or RPE has to be worn to certain standards because we're protecting against some pretty high level hazards in these areas. OK, so uh, effectively, PPE regs don't really apply if these regulations are enforced because they will be covering off the PPE side of things. But we can still use PPE regs to help us define as to what PPE is, how it should be provided, stored, maintained, trained, etc. So those are some pieces of uh, legislation to help us and also some guidance. Um, again, like I say, we'll give you this slide deck. So you have this list at the end of the day, some good stuff to go away and look at. We have the ACOP for the regs at the top there. And bear in mind that will be updated when the legislation gets updated as well. OK, so April the 6th, look out for that. That will become updated on the HSE websites. But also we have some guidance documents there as well. So. Um, we have a, a brief guide, you know, sort of six to eight pages that you may wish to share with your staff, okay? Or we actually have some um, more detailed documents, especially things like HSG 5.3 we'll look at a bit later, okay? Really, really strong document, really good document to support you in choosing the correct RPE in work as well. Um, I'd always advise you guys to go off towards things like Kosh Essentials and their direct advice sheets. And they have that for a variety of industries, sectors, tasks, processes, etc. Some really good information out there. And that will start to specify the finite detail. So, for example, when we're looking at welding fumes, it will specify, you know, welding helmet to BS12492 with a, you know, a T2 filter and all this sort of stuff and APF factor. All the niche detail comes through in those documents. So go out to those documents, seek those out, okay, and they will have some really, really good advice and guidance for yourselves out there. And there may well be some stuff for your industry that is a bit more specific. So, for example, uh, when you look at um, sort of uh, tree surgeons, arboriculturists, that sort of thing, you know, when you look at chainsaws, obviously very high hazard activity, they'll specify the recommendations or the mandatory PPE that people should be wearing. Um, I always also try and put in some research and stats around this topic, and that's quite difficult because the summary stats are quite high level. And to drill down with PPE, we go back, um, admittedly, over 20 years, unfortunately, um, in terms of um, you know, looking at you know, a research report that was covered. OK, and they focus on a seven year period um, and uh, identified within that as best they could um, different ident identifiers of different types of PPE and also different failures. The reasons as to why or how PPE could have been involved or contributed towards incidents and accidents during that, that period. Um, admittedly, there are some limitations. Okay, like I say, it is over 20 years old, and Riddle itself has changed since then. Okay, it got updated in 2013. Um, but what it does provide us is some information around how um, PPE can impact and can be uh, focused on uh, in you know, linking to accidents. Um, they estimated a good sort of 9,000 uh, incidents per year were um, as a result of um, you know, linked with PPE. And they did a sample of 973 accidents and found that 920 of those involved PPE. So a good sort of 95% or so were involved there. On the left hand side, um, we look at the breakdown of types of PPE. So um, foot protection, hand and arm protection, eye and face uh, coming out as quite high numbers there. Um, and on the right hand side, causes of accidents. OK, and whilst um, the majority, a third or so were sort of um, sort of other causes, we do find things such as um, PPE is provided but not being used as a key contributor. Um, Specific PPE, okay, uh, was not um, listed, okay, or we just didn't consider using PPE in the first place, okay. So there are some key reasons as to why those accidents and incidences were occurring. 
Now, whilst we do have some limitations, and I admit that is the case, okay, uh, what they worked out were this set of figures on the right hand side, um, the percentages. And if we were to try and sort of overlay that onto today's stats, and I appreciate there are limitations, things have changed, and that sort of stuff. But at least it gets the, the brain juices flowing a little bit to consider that actually um, during 20 to 21 summary stats, we recorded 142 fatalities in the workplace. Well, if we put that 17% on top of that, then we're considering as many as 24 fatalities could have been caused by uh, PPE in some way, whether, again, we haven't considered it, it's not been used properly, or the correct one wasn't specified. So I appreciate does have limitations, okay, and stats are stats. You can read into them how you wish. I appreciate that. Um, but like I say, it does actually give us something to consider that, you know, 17% of fatalities could have been prevented if we had better PPE or RPE controls in place. Okay, so it's food for thoughts uh, linked to this topic. So the legislation update itself. OK, um, is we're gonna, you know, the um, the PPE uh, at work amendment regulations are due to be coming into force on the 6th of April this year. OK, and what's quite a key thing to explain to you guys is that um, in general, OK, the regulations have not changed. They've simply been expanded. OK, so we still have that duty and responsibility on both the employer and the employees. OK, but like I say, it now becomes extended to what we define as limb B workers. OK, so um, they are, that is defined in the next couple of slides for us. OK, but like I say, it's now an extension towards those. So if we by risk assessment establish that PPE or RPE is required, OK, we must ensure as employers, OK, that we provide that for workers as well as employees. OK, and that they also have sufficient information, instruction and training on the use of that PPE. But in return, as we would expect from our employees, OK, Limby workers also then have that duty to use the PPE in accordance with the training instruction that we provide, etc. OK, and make sure that it's also returned um, and you know, stored and maintained correctly, as we would expect. So um, how we define LIM B workers, OK, so um, within the Employment Rights Act, OK, uh, workers have two limbs. You have A and B. Um, LIM B um, focuses or describes workers who generally have a more casual employment um, and work under contract for service. And the main reason why a lot of this came about was because of the High Court case that took place a couple of years ago, where companies such as um, Uber and Deliveroo and Just Eat and that sort of stuff um, had these casual staff that were not being recognised as employees, um, but they weren't being recognised as anything else. So this is where this has all stemmed out of. And if I'm honest, um, there may well be other regulations that could start to incur this. Um, PPE, I think, was one of the primary ones to sort out. We might find things that is DSE might start coming up. You know, we'll have to see how things happen over the coming months and years. But that's our definition of a limby worker and the reason as to why, like I say, it's been extended, it's been expanded, but not altered, such, uh, so to speak, with the regulations. Um, and what is PPE? We've been talking about this quite a lot during the course of the session, obviously. OK, but we define PPE as such from the uh, from the regulations. So all equipment uh, intended to be worn or held by a person at work. OK, and it will protect against one or more risks to that person's health and safety. Okay? And uh, where uh, we find it necessary to provide PPE and RPE following risk assessment, OK, as employers, we have a duty provider free of charge. Now, if you're uh, in the boat where you have both, okay, employees and workers, okay, um, essentially there is no difference in the way that we provide it, okay. Um, like I say, it just needs to be extended and expanded to our workers. So just to reiterate, we need to provide training and instruction that's used to workers as well as employees. OK, we're not able to charge workers 
the PPE they require, okay? Again, as we would do with our employees. And it's really important, again, we'll reiterate during the course of the show, okay, a suitable PPE, okay? I stress suitable PPE is provided, it's compatible, okay? It's well-maintained, there's correct storage provided, and we ensure it's used properly. And that's both as an employer monitoring and supervising staff, but as us as employees also making sure we follow that instruction and use it in the way that it's been designed to and intended. So uh, our next section, our second part, is concentrating on exposure levels and risk controls. And now we get a little bit of a chicken egg sort of situation here. Um, so, um, you know, we, essentially we can look at planning um, PP and RP based on hazard identification, guidance, experience, knowledge, and that sort of stuff. But if we don't know what the exposure level is, how do we know we're providing enough of the right protection? So uh, sometimes we may have to find that we're doing some interim measures, maybe going worst case scenario, and to actually get an opportunity to actually, you know, sort of monitor and prove what it is there. I'm going to cover off exposure levels first, okay? Um, and again, we, we get, draw these levels come through from sort of different pieces of legislation, different guidance notes, different monitoring services as well. And this is where it starts to get a bit tricky for us, especially when you start to consider things like you know, RPE selection, which we'll get onto later. But when we go to those legislation, go to that guidance, we start to work in different units. And whilst some of these be quite immediately recognisable to us, such as milligram per cubic metre or parts per million, decibels, uh, we should all be fairly familiar with. But as soon as we start get down to things like vibration, we're now starting to have to calculate acceleration. So metres uh, is per sec per um, so um, uh, you know, first second squared, and also get further down as well. The hazard increases. The sort of uh, measuring devices start to increase further as well. So things like fiber, uh, sorry, fibers per cubic meter for asbestos, or uh, micro sieverts for radiation and um, leads. We start to even look at sort of micrograms per deciliter of blood. So we're starting to look at some quite confusing units if we're not readily familiar with it. Um, key things uh, for us to consider when we actually get provided with the exposure limits, okay, is that they cannot be exceeded, um, especially when we have things like EH40, we have those limits in place. We have to consider different effects, so we consider the acute effect of the hazard, but that individual exposure, that short, sharp, sudden release, uh, you know, to, to what we're dealing with, or maybe those chronic implications as well. So how things build over time and those consistent small exposures can lead to um, greater things uh, later down the line. It can start to get a bit uh, confusing, a bit subjective. So if we take EH40, for example, uh, and others, we're looking at 15 minute periods for acute exposure and eight hour time weighted average periods for others. But then how do we start to you know, focus on people that work 10 hour shifts, 12 hour shifts? Um, you know, how do we sort of measure that with people who have sporadic use and sporadic engagement with the hazard? So again, those sort of considerations can be difficult. We also have different, within some different things like action values. So noise, for example, and vibration will have different action values where we you know, suddenly have to provide hearing protection or we have to you know, manage it and drop it down between, you know, between, uh, beneath a certain level. So again, it's knowing these action values and where we hit them and how we hit them um, uh, and how we control within them. It's fair to say that you know the working environment will have a big effect on things. If we you know we're using something that kicks out you know eighty decibels um, in a, a very small cabinet versus outside, there's going to be a different impact, isn't there, on the individual? So working environment can have uh, you know uh, an effect. It can be uh, you know if we're working daytime, working at nighttime, working at the weekends, all this sort of thing can have a different impact on the individual. We may have individuals that are naturally more susceptible to uh, to injury, to harm, to disease. OK, so that is certainly a consideration, especially when we're considering sort of respiratory hazards. If people may be asthmatic or have COPD or have other underlying conditions. 
And sometimes when we're doing multiple hazards at a time, we can have synergistic or combination effects as well. So we may not always understand or fully interpret how the different hazards will interact with each other. So again, it gets quite difficult, quite technical in places for us to work out you know, exactly what we're being exposed to, what exactly the limit is, um, and how we sort of control against that. Um, so how can we measure against su such small limits? OK, because, for example, um, we take this, uh, you may well have seen this image beforehand on various sort of construction information series documents and what have you. OK, that is to scale the size or the amount that um, following all the right controls, that's the uh, maximum daily limits of silica dusts at 0.1 milligrams per cubic metre. OK, so again. Um, how do we even see that or how do we quantify that, how do we pick that up, okay? And the best way for us to do that, okay, is to measure the exposure. And I mentioned two documents here, HSG173 is monitoring strategies with toxic substances, and then G409 um, is part of the, uh, the health series that they run, the HSE, and this is around air measurements, okay? And this is what we expect, um, or what you should expect from a competent consultant who's providing monitoring services. So we use those documents in tandem, that'd be really helpful, okay? Um, because um, that will um, open up um, you know, you know, this world to yourselves and understand how it works, how what they should be doing, or how they shouldn't be working, uh, and make sure that they're giving the correct service to yourselves. And we've got a range of sampling techniques that are on the screen there, whether it be something simple, handheld devices, these ready reckoners, you know, the, um, in terms of you know, the, the decibel meters there, or the, the traffic light system gives a visual indicator to people in the workshop, to uh, personal monitoring devices on the right-hand side, various pumps, various dosimeters, that kind of thing, various, various sampling techniques, to actually that top central image where we actually have, like, say, this consultant come in, an occupational hygienist, come in and do some direct measurements uh, of those exposure levels uh, you know, over a period of time, down to individuals, work patterns, et cetera, so we can build up this profile of what we're being exposed to in the workplace. And then like I say, once we have an understanding of what we're being exposed to, whether it can be by knowledge, guidance, legislation, or through monitoring and that sort of stuff, we can then start to look at how we apply our risk controls. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a hierarchy drawn from the principles of prevention, but we uh, uh, sort of uh, restrict it down to this model, which I'm sure, again, you would have seen on a number of times, okay? Emphasizes, okay, the fact that we must control the risk at the source, okay? So we should always look to eliminate the hazard, okay, at first, try and avoid it. And if we can't do that, then we understand how we can try to substitute it, change it, replace it to make it a safer alternative or safer for us to engage with, okay? Um, unfortunately, well, it doesn't push so much, and that's why I mentioned the principles of prevention. We must always seek to provide controls to the masses before focusing on the individual. So that's when we have things like scaffold um, to, to so have multiple people on, rather than giving every individual um, you know, their own sort of control measure, okay? Same, same in terms of this with uh, with PP especially and RPE and breathing hazards, etc. So this gives us this this uh, this model and it emphasizes the fact that when we get down to PPE, okay, it's our least effective form of control because if we go to that primarily first, we're bypassing stronger methods, but also we're purely then relying on humans. Um, and by nature, we cut corners, we take the easy option, uh, we maybe misunderstand things, mis misinterpret, maybe think we know better. Okay, so we, um, that's why PPE often sits, or it does sit as our last line of defence, if you like, with this. And I'm just to sort of show how um, human interaction can actually uh, influence on it. So if we take our engineering controls, our third level there, okay, this is where it can start to go wrong for us. So take this, for example, a pillar drill, okay, so we may well be quite familiar with it, uh, but if we're not, um, this uh, drill bit uh, will, will be rotating at sort of several thousand RPM, and this screen here is uh, as a guard with a micro switch or, or an interlock. So effectively, the machine should only operate when the micro switch is engaged. A bit like a microwave at home, it should only turn on when the door is closed. 
Okay, does an engineering control? That's a really good control, isn't it? Because it can own that can only operate when that is engaged. Therefore, the operator is safe. However, a different form of engineering control is this. Okay, also fits around and above the, the chuck. Okay, the screen will cover the rotating stock and the drill bits and the workpiece and what have you. However, this is now reliant on a human understanding they need to lower that before they operate. Also, the fact that they snap in place quite quickly, so they often crack as soon as you do it for the first time, and they are adjustable. Now, the machine will operate if that is up or down. So straight away, whilst we have actually got an engineering control and we're at our third level of the hierarchy, so we're providing a good control, we are still relying on a human to understand that process and understand what they need to do. And whilst it does go a bit off tangent, so I'm not going to go too far with this, I'd recommend looking at HSG 4.8, uh, which is reducing error and influencing behaviour. OK, um, and this starts to look at why errors occur. And on the right hand side, we have the image where we consider uh, sort of inputs by the job, by the organisation, by the individual. But on the left hand side, we actually look at when a, a failure occurs. We try to have this sort of explanation tree, if you like, um, expanding to the right of it. So that top section, we focus on um, general sort of human error. OK, um, and we look at uh, the tree that's sort of going up in this top section here. OK, and that's an action or decision which is not intended, but involved a deviation from an accepted standard. And then obviously that then leads to those um, you know, undesirable outcomes, near misses, incidents, etc. We look at the violation section, though. Uh, violations occur when a deliberate deviation from a rule or procedure takes place. OK, um, so we do have things such as a, a routine violation, and that can happen when basically, um, you know, uh, you know, doing something just becomes the norm. OK, you've broken away from what you should be doing, but everyone does it. Okay, It just comes part of the culture, part of the normal way of work. We might have situational violations. OK, and that might be because of some of these issues, the job, organisation, individual, etc., OK, uh, a, a person has actually decided to, to break the rules because of pressures from the job, OK, um, such as it, the situation they're in. Or we might have some exceptional violations. And these are quite rare, OK, but this is where we get to a position where um, something has gone quite considerably wrong um, and we're trying to solve the problem by sort of breaking rules and we're aware that it might be going wrong but we think actually do you know what we'll take the risk because it's actually worth it versus the benefit of risk reduction sort of thing okay uh, a key example was chernobyl um when they're doing the tests operator failure led to low power levels and at that point they should have stopped the test should have abandoned it gone to their emergency procedures and sorted things out However, they just continued to improvise, okay, and basically every step they took became more unfamiliar, more unstable, and actually we know how that worked out in the end. So it's well worth having a bit of human behaviours, human factors in the back of our minds on this topic. And like I said, when we actually provide these, um, you know, these facilities, we must focus on the collective versus the individual, okay? So looking at things such as where possible, uh, where practicable, okay, introduction of things like LED and hoods and sort of general sort of ventilation first and then start to drill down to the individuals involved and how they need to be protected as an individual. Um, and then furthermore, when we actually do introduce these, okay, again, we need to provide the relevant facilities. Uh, and Jason, excellent point. I apologise for not having CDM listed on the previous guidance. It was an oversight when I wrote the course. Um, but obviously, this does come into it under CDM, as well as the other you know, complementary legislation I discussed earlier. Okay, having this appropriate um, uh, you know, av availability for welfare facilities and other admin controls really, really important. We go through all four levels before we reach the fifth and final level of that inverted pyramid to provide PPE. Um, like I say, I do a lot of work with companies with cosh and chemicals and, and what have you and that sort of stuff. And a key way that people uh, receive harm or you know, is, is to ingest uh, chemicals because either they haven't washed their hands properly 
or when they remove their gloves, they haven't done it the correct way, they cross-contaminate, they go out for a fag, they go for their lunch, and again, they're like I say, they're ingesting it in that way themselves as well. Okay, so, so do consider how uh, welfare facilities need to be provided, making sure people are getting away from the workstation, away from the workplace. Okay, they have the opportunity to go through hand washing, to, to change and to shower if they need to, depending again on the hazard that is there. Okay, and provide the training around that. Okay, it might seem simple, it might seem a little bit dumb. Um, I did a lot of work. Uh, I used to be um, at a college um, before with SSG and I did a lot of work with our first aiders when COVID hits. And again, it's a key reminder of how you take the glove off, how you put it on, how you sort of roll it up inside itself and turn it inside out. It may seem quite simplistic and might be good stuff to do as sort of some toolbox talks and some you know, refreshers and that sort of stuff. But do provide that information do provide that training and under, make sure people understand how to put PPE on, how to take it off, how to store it, how to report it if there are any issues, okay? Because all that information, all that training is valuable to us as managers, as employers, as supervisors, et cetera. And just onto our last section is around actually selecting PPE and RPE as well. And this is where obviously this can at times become a bit of a dark art. Um, uh, and I'm gonna take us through some of the bits and pieces as we go through this last section. So despite all our best efforts, we've tried to avoid it. We try to substitute hazards. We try to input uh, engineering controls and safe systems of work and that sort of stuff we may still find that some hazards still remain, okay? And that's when obviously we need to turn to looking at providing PPE and RPE. And as I mentioned in the previous section, it should be our last resort. Now, when we're starting to actually consider the introduction of it, okay, we need to ask ourselves some questions. So understand who is it being exposed, okay, and to what, because we understand that obviously Quite simply, we know who we're giving the PPE to, but if we know what they're being exposed to, again, that's going to start taking us down a certain route on our selection. Consider the route of entry, okay, or uh, area that's going to be affected or how people can be harmed, because again, we can kind of reverse engineer that, can't we? Okay, uh, if we know that people are going to get a, uh, have harm if they breathe things in, we've tried LEV, we've tried fume cupboards, we're still having all these control measures, we're still looking at it, right, I need to put on a mask, I need to put on a hood or, or some method, again, to block that entry for an inhalation hazard. Understand how long we're being exposed for. Again, this could be quite sporadic, it could be sort of five minutes at a time, it could be an hour, it could be longer. Than an hour and then we really start to need to consider you know again comfort suitability adaptability workability whilst wearing the items and again understanding how much we're being exposed to is a p2 filter going to cut it or do we need to go to a p3 filter for example um other things to think about are there are standards to these items okay and i'm gonna I'll, i've got a slide on standards alone OK, but we must make sure that the correct standard is being uh, being uh, applied. OK, and that our uh, you know, items, our equipment is adhering to those standards. We must be looking for CE and or UK CA marking on these items as well. OK, again, those two go hand in hand because we know they've been through the testing. We know that it's a reputable product, reputable supplier. And what have you and we know that a standard is going to be maintained and consistency products do though however focus on uh, reptile suppliers i bought a, a push stick that i use as an example in woodworking from amazon um, i got it for eight pound and it's got ce marked in it but the c is correct it's got the curly c but the e looks like the e on your screen there OK, so they've tried to copy it, but obviously got it quite wrong. So that's just one of the issues with that. So, again, reptile suppliers, uh, reptile purchasing streams and what have you will support you on that. As I mentioned a couple of times, OK, PPE and RPE must be suitable. OK, and to qualify under that, we have those five key points there. OK, it must be suited to the user. OK, so make sure it fits them. Uh, it's the right size, it's the right fit, it's the right comfort, okay? It's compatible, so when we ask to start wearing multiple items, we're not actually introducing hazards or introducing discomforts. 
They must be maintained, so especially for reusable devices, okay, um, that they are that are cleaned and stored and maintained and repaired and updated as we need to. We provide correct storage and again that correct use of the items. And all of that can be supported by streams of information, instruction, training, and supervision by us as the employer, but also managers, supervisors, and to each other. A bit of a buddy buddy system goes a long, long way. Um, when we look at the different types, there are seven main types of PPE, okay, that will protect certain areas. Okay, so we'll have uh, ones that will protect the eyes, ones that will protect the head and neck, ones that will protect the ears, ones that protect hands and arms, feet and legs, lungs, and then whole body as well, okay? Um, each of them have their pros and cons, but just consider that if we're trying to cover off all of those items, each individual item only protects one part of you at a time, okay? So if you're wearing safety eyewear, it's not gonna do anything for your hands, is it? So if we're starting to identify multiple hazards, multiple exposure levels in all these different areas, do consider that actually by the time you've put on each of these items, by the time you walk five minutes across the site, you're probably gonna need to sit down for another five minutes, okay? Because it can start to get, um, can start to wear you out, make you quite insular as well. So you can feel quite um, sort of separated from other people, can be difficult to hear, difficult to engage, or you may not be aware of other hazards happening in and around you, because again, we're so, uh, you know, so much in our own little bubble of PPE, if you like. But those are the different types of PPE that we can go to, those different areas, okay, and the areas that they protect. And when we start to select these items, okay, we do have a huge amount of information we can go out to and find out. So things such as like, the actual legislation itself, as well as our guidance documents we talked about earlier. At times, safety data sheets will specify certain types of PPE that need to be worn. Um, so whether it be sort of hand and arm protection or RPE, that kind of thing as well. Do consider though with, an, with a safety data sheet, we do have some issues in that they normally work on 100% pure lab conditions, okay? So um, whilst we, you know, it might say that we need to wear sort of fluorinated rubber sort of gauntlets for a process because it's expecting us to deal with 100% conk acid, actually we start to do little droplets of that, okay? Literally a little dab at a time. You know, is that a reasonably practicable control measure? So it can be a bit difficult at times with safety data sheets and COSH. Also go out to the manufacturers and suppliers. Okay, there are lots of really good reputable uh, suppliers, national and local suppliers, and they'll be more than happy to talk to you guys in terms of, you know, I've got an issue, I think this is the right thing, is this the right thing? Okay, we'll be more than happy to discuss that with you, maybe give some alternatives, OK, because they want to make sure that they've got a valued customer, but they're in that game to keep people safe, aren't they? Uh, you may also wish to come to, to, to sort of different consultancy and training services. We provide a full range of, of those, obviously, and I've done a lot of work with clients when I've visited sites and said, well, if you do this this way or that way, or have you considered this? Um, I do a lot of COSH training sessions. I do a lot of risk assessment training sessions, and they're really, really good to get, start getting people to think about things because actually what I tend to find is that PPE is the first option for a lot of people. And uh, I think that's just quite natural because, you know, it's uh, if you if you see someone wear PPE, you think they're, they're working safely. Yeah, it's quite a natural instinctive thing to protect us as an individual or protect people as an individual. Um, so it's really good to sort of break that thought process through those training services and realise we have a hierarchy to follow. And if we are resorting to this, then we can actually drill down on some more specific areas for us to focus on. And also, you may already have some existing assessments or cost assessments in your workplace. You may have safe systems of work that have been around for a long time and they work, they're successful. But also go to your colleagues, not mentioned on there, but talk to your staff, talk to your colleagues, talk to your workmates. People have been doing that job for a bit longer than yourselves or have a bit more sort of controlled in that area. They'll understand the hazard, understand the people wearing the gear and understand the most appropriate um, items to wear. And that will help you know, your choice as well. Um, I mentioned standards. 
uh, on a, a slide or two ago. Okay, when we come to our standards, they are normally written in a pattern where we have a, a BS and or an EN and or an ISO at the start of it. We then get a number code, which if there's a relevant part to it, we represented by a dash, and then you'll get the colons for the year if it's relevant as well. So some familiar ones on the screen that you may well come across, EN166, okay, is for safety eyewear. Okay, so well done if you got that, if you recognize that straight away. However, is that gonna be suitable for people who are using lasers? Okay, so we then look to a different standard, okay? We've got 374, again, part one. And again, uh, full marks if you're uh, recognising that's looking at protective gloves against dangerous chemicals and microorganisms, OK? Um, but if we're actually operating machinery and work tools and hand tools and that sort of stuff, you know, maybe we're actually looking at a different type of standard, OK? Um, and then also 143, again, if you recognise this one, we're looking at respiratory protective devices with particle filters, okay? But again, is that going to be appropriate if we're trying to do welding activities? Um, there are literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of standards and all have different parts, different sections, different details to go by. So again, it can become a bit of a dark art. Um, there are guidance documents out there, but again, if you talk to uh, talk to the experts, talk to the providers, talk to the manufacturers, they will be able to support you in that area. But at least if we know we're adhering to a standard, we know that we're providing that level of protection to our staff and our workers. Um, a bit about RPE, okay, to, to wrap up this section, take us towards the end, okay. Um, Again, RPE, we actually start to look at um, harmful substances contaminating the air, okay? Um, also, we might need to use it when oxygen levels are or maybe come low. So we have ozone, for example, or asphyxiation hazards, uh, you know, confined spaces and that sort of stuff. And just like the world of PPE, there are many different types of RPE as well. And so we do emphasise the fact that RPE providers must be both adequate and suitable, okay? And we'll have a look at how that uh, is, is brought through in these next few slides. So we have um, sort of two main types, if you like. Okay, we have our um, respirators and we have breathing apparatus. So a, a respirator, okay, uh, well, they're both available in various different styles, but a respirator, okay, um, can either be a, a tight-fitting face piece, often referred to as a mask, and this relies on that good seal with the wearer's face, kind of face fit testing and what have you. Um, and we can have these as both powered and non-powered options, or we have breathing apparatus as well. Um, and we have the options there, tight fitting and loose fitting. The loose fitting ones is when we rely on enough clean air being provided to the wearer to prevent that contamination leaking in. So that's when we're looking at hoods and helmets and visors and that sort of stuff. Uh, a key point on there, okay, respirators we must not be using those um, in oxygen deficient atmospheres because obviously we're not we actually we're not actually being provided a fresh stream of oxygen as we would do with a breathing apparatus. Now, when we go to select um, our RPE, heavily recommend going to HSG 53. And this flow chart um, is figure four within that, because if you can read that, um, you're quite incredible. OK, uh, but it's just put up there for reference for you guys. OK, so where we understand that an inhalation uh, risk uh, remains after our reasonable controls, we look to provide it. OK. We also may have to provide it as certain interim measures. So if we've uh, installed uh, you know, uh, you know, a process and we realise that we're going to need to actually have LED, but LED takes time to get them to come in, to commission, to install, etc., we may provide RPE first and then remove it once the LED is in place. We might have some emergency work, okay? It just has to happen. We haven't got time to mess around with higher level of controls. It's, it's do or die kind of process. So we've got to have that. Or for emergency retrievals. So um, let's say ozone and confined space uh, re you know, recovery work. Um, but also might consider actually short-term or frequent exposure actually 
uh, it, you know, RPE is actually a more reasonably practicable um, sort of solution. So if we're doing car spraying, for example, but we're doing smart spraying, so small to medium area, okay, um, we might only have a small area like that. We're doing it outside. We've got a spray can, and we're literally going to do a few sprays for a maximum of 30 seconds, okay? You know, we might find here RPE is a more suitable application there. So we do have a process to follow through in that document. Now, um, part of um, the selection process, if we, uh, especially if we're using respirators, okay, we look at the various types of filters, okay, and obviously the way in which it works is, um, you know, the, the right filter for the right hazard present to try and remove that hazard as people are breathing in the area. Um, essentially, we have two different types. Uh, we have uh, in the mainstream, we have particle filters and we have gas or vapour filters that's really important be like diesel and petrol into your car okay particle filters for particles gas and vapor for gas and vapors okay they don't work for the other um, neither of these options should be used in an oxygen deficient atmosphere and do consider do remember that airborne liquids such as like sort of aerosols and spray paints and that sort of stuff they actually require a particle filter rather than a gas or a vapour filter because they still have particulates in the air that we're breathing. Now, as we start to go through the choice mode of this side of things, and again, going through that um, flow chart I showed you a couple of slides ago, we start to look at something called an assigned protection factor. And this is unique to RPE because um, you know, each different type, each different filter, each different fitting and workpiece um, actually gets given a different APF. And the APF number indicates how much protection is being provided to the individual. So if you were to, example, find something that said APF 10, so let's say a, you know, a, a P2 dust mask, okay, the wearer will only breathe in one tenth of the contamin contaminant present in the air or less than that. OK, so they're still going to be exposed to a small amount of contaminant, but only a tenth of the air rather than um, you know, a higher percentage. Now, when we select and apply, okay, we calculate the value required. You should always go to a higher value. And um, in terms of how we establish that value, again, SDS, cost essentials, direct advice sheets will give this information to us. Um, uh, anyone doing sort of uh, asbestos work, whether it be non-licensed or licensed, that will start to be uh, specified as well. Normally, we're going to APF 20, maybe APF 40 with those areas. OK, there are only a set amount of APF numbers um, starting at uh, you know, have like 2, 4, 10, 20, 40, up to 100, up to 1,000, up to 2,000. OK, so we can get very fine detail levels of protection. Now, if it's not available to us by SDS or cost essentials or other forms of information, okay, there is a way that we can calculate the amount of protection that's required. So the example we get given here, again, from HSG 5.3, and again, that document really does expand this. So if I leave you uncertain from today, go to that document, okay, lots of really good information in that area there. When we go to look at it, this is where monitoring comes in, okay, is really important for us. So we'll take the measured um, concentration in the air, okay, so this example is saying we've got 350 parts per million within that eight hour period of toluene. That's what's been measured. We go to the EH40 documents, and we find that toluene, okay, has a part per million uh, limit of 50, okay, for that eight hour period. So we take the amount measured, we divide it by the limits, and that gives us a result of seven, okay? As I mentioned beforehand, the APF must always be higher. So we then go for an APF of 10, okay, for the minimum amount of protection required for that hazard. So that's, again, a different way of how we can calculate the APF. And one last way in which HSG 53 helps us in terms of selecting our RPE is they have this table here as well. They have the different types. So this is just focus on respirators. There is one for breathing apparatus as well. But when that starts to come into play and we start to balance up our options, this is where we can actually start to think about, is it effective for particles or vapors? 
you know, how long can we wear it for? So less than an hour or more than an hour. And then we start to look at the different APF types here. So they've listed the most common ones, 410, 20, 40, 200, and 2000. And then they've got a page per item in that document as well to give you even more information. But I highlight it because a disposable half mask and a reusable face mask offer by this the same level of protection, the same level of APF. OK, but which one are you going to choose? Which one would you prefer to choose? Which one would you prefer to wear for a long period of time? So, again, this option, this discussion really starts to come out into play. Um, just a, a couple of closing slides before I start to wrap up. We are getting towards the end of our time this morning. OK, and appreciate I made us drop over slightly and appreciate people may need to leave. Um, do think about maintenance. OK, make sure that the correct kit is there. The correct filters are there. The correct parts, buckles, straps, etc. So we can actually make uh, replacements. OK, understand how we report it. Who do we tell? Who do we go to to get these parts? How do we provide that information? to our employees and it's a duty of our employees and our workers therefore coming up in April as well to make the proper use of what we provide to them and to report any uh, destruction or any faults and uh, one thing I try to pass off again when I talk to people in these workshop sessions we do consider how your assessment is read okay again it might seem obvious in your head but think about how you pass it on to other people so if your assessment is something says something like all persons must wear gloves what, so when I come to visit you, I've got to put some gloves on? Yeah, visitors, the cleaners, the director, okay? Or how about that? It's a bit stronger, isn't it? Operatives pour in preparation into machine, must wear gloves. Yeah, so we're, again, we're drilling it down to who's being exposed, who's being engaged with that hazard. But does that give us enough? Must wear appropriate gloves. Okay, so we're getting a bit closer to it, aren't we? Okay. But it's still not quite there. Whereas if you have a statement like that, operative problem preparation machine must wear chemical resistant and pervious gloves compliant to EN374 made from nitrile rubber. That's quite difficult to waver from, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very clear, very direct instruction that is getting contained within our risk assessment. OK, so we compare the different levels of instruction there or different levels of clarity, for example. Yeah. OK. I would always go for that bottom option because, you know, the more detail you give to people, if you treat people like they're fresh out of the womb, they've never done that task before. OK. Then it's really important to pass on that exact information people to people. And again, consider the application. So I just gave the instruction of wearing those chemical resistant gloves. OK, something like that. Would you wear those gloves to use that? Now, I did my car the weekend. OK, personally, I didn't. I poured it into a jug. I poured it in. I kept it safe in that method there for limited use, for sporadic use. Me at home topping up my windscreen wash. I probably wouldn't. If you're a car mechanic and you're doing maintenance on a fleet of vehicles, you probably should. OK, and again, we go to the information provided us from the safety data sheet. We look at the application, we look at the, the exposure, we look at the length of time, we look at how you know, we can reduce the exposure and we provide the most suitable method for that. So just some closing points and apologies again, I'm just creeping over. So if you do need to go, I do appreciate, okay? But um, when we're looking at this topic, PPE and RPE, okay? Like I said, whilst it's our last line of defense, it will prevent injury and ill health if it's selected carefully, okay? Select, select, correct selection, correct use as well, okay? Always follow the hierarchy of risk controls, okay? And please do favor collective protection over individual protection. And when we reach that decision, we're gonna provide PPE and or RPE, okay? Please ensure it is provided, okay? Free of charge as well. It's compatible, it's maintained, it's correctly stored, okay? And also it's used properly by the individual. And we can do that either by our direct training, direct supervision, direct monitoring, all that buddy buddy system yeah you notice someone's walked on the shop floor and you cross the yellow line and you should be wearing glasses but they haven't they're still up on their head 
Just give him a nudge. Oh, mate. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Yeah. Look out for each other in the workplace. And always, if unsure, seek help. Okay. Go to those external sources. Go to those internal sources. Okay. We're here. Manufacturers are here. Suppliers are here. Seek help where required. And always, always, always seek out to provide that information, instruction, training and supervision to your employees. And as of the 6th of April, workers, if you have them as well. OK, so uh, that brings us to uh, to a close for today's session. OK, I have crept over slightly. So thank you for your patience. Uh, I will hang on because I think I've got a couple of people who've got some questions uh, or, or hands up. OK, but if I um, if I stop sharing there, OK, um, I'll also stop the recording in a moment as well. Um, this leads me uh, to say thank you so much for your time. It's great to have so many people with us today, have so much interest in the topic. I appreciate today has probably opened up some questions, opened up some thoughts, some next steps. By all means, please do get in touch with us or seek out that information from those sources I mentioned because help is there, it's available, and we'd love to be able to assist you. Um, but uh, that leads me to say thank you for your time. All the best. Take care of yourselves and uh, see you in the next session, hopefully. Thank you guys.